Uh, yeah, I know it's 9 a.m. and nothing creative happens before 11 a.m., um, but we're going to do our best. Hey! Uh, I'm glad nobody's sitting in the first two rows except for you. Sorry. Uh, the airline took my toothpaste. It's for your own protection. Um, so uh, I wanted to call this talk how we did what we did. We're happy with what we did, and we're super proud of what we did, and we did it really fast, but I guess this is a better title. Coco VR. Um, we had a really, really great time making this. We released this last year in conjunction with the film, and I'm excited to tell you guys how we did what we did. So let's dive right in. Uh, I'm going to go over a couple of things. First, the introductions, and then first steps in terms of how we were actually able to take the Pixar models and animations and all of their film assets and put them into VR, and then uh, how we went through our planning and prototyping phase, and uh, what we did with some of the social interaction. Uh, center stage, meaning how we got the user to feel like they were immersed in the environment and how we got them to feel like they were a part of that world. And then uh, finally, what we did after wrap when we finished everything up. So uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Kaylin Ray. I'm the development supervisor at Magnopus. Magnopus was the uh, vendor company. We, we created this in conjunction with Disney and Pixar and Oculus. Um, <clears throat> we've done a number of things over the last few years. I've been working with Magnopus for the last three years. Some of the other projects that we've done were uh, the Blade Runner 2049 Memory Lab experience. We also released uh, CNN VR earlier this year. Uh, I, for this project in particular, I was the lead experience designer on the Magnopus side. Pixar also had a director, and we all know how good Pixar is at designing and making things, so they, of course, have their own creative team. Magnopus has their own creative team as well, and that's where I come from. Uh, I come from, <laughs> sorry, I also come from film before I started in, in VR. I come from the visual effects side of things. I've worked on set for a little while. I worked in pre animation for a little while. The last film credit that I had before I started working in VR was uh, The Jungle Book, and I was on the virtual production team for that show. And it was awesome because I live in LA, and it shot in LA, and that was great, and they had the best breakfast burritos for free all you can eat every morning. If I could just talk 20 minutes about that, that would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so a bit of an overview. First off, how many people here have actually done Coco VR before? That's like four or five. Yeah. <laughs> that penetration, you know? Um, so uh, Coco VR is a marketing tie-in for the Pixar film. Uh, it we built it with, with extreme like, uh, uh, collaboration with Disney and Pixar, meaning like day to day, like we're on the same Slack channels and all of that kind of stuff. They're in Emeryville, we're in Los Angeles, but uh, communication was very, very easy. Um, basically, we wanted to take the user from their living room and drop them into this beautiful fantasy world that Disney has created and allow them to sort of explore it for themselves. But at the end of the day, it is a marketing piece, and it's something that we're using to promote the film. But our goal was to make it not feel like a marketing piece. We wanted to expand what that could be. Uh, I haven't heard anybody use the phrase poison the well in like a couple of years. I feel like the zeitgeist has kind of gone from that. But every time you reintroduce a new style of content to this emerging platform, it's very dangerous. And we want to make sure that when we start saying, hey, big studios are getting involved in VR, and this is all awesome, here's a marketing piece. Like, we want to make sure that it's worthy of this medium. I'm a strong advocate for VR. I love VR. As the lead designer on this, I wanted to make sure that it was, that it, if you are investing in a high-end PC, if you are going to put this thing on your face, we're not going to waste your time. And we're not going to pander to you. And we're not going to make it obvious. We want you to have a good time. We want you to feel like you're part of the world. That's the point, is to sell the IP. 
not just the movie, it's everything related to this. And you can't do that by just saying, watch the film, watch the film, watch the film. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we, we were being appropriate for the audience. Uh, a couple of problems that we encountered right off the bat was scale. Uh, as you can see by this freakishly sized spider creature, uh, scale in VR is an interesting concept. As every user is a different height and it's your real actual height. Uh, another problem that we face though is that because your full body is an IK system where you can see your legs and you can see your arms, not only do we have to scale your head, but we also have to scale the length of your arms and that requires some kind of elaborate calibration process. But thankfully, we were able to get around that because using the design language of the film, all of the skeletons are able to separate their bones from their body. So if your arms are really long, we could just separate the bones of the body and yay, less math. <laughs> uh, projection, so we did not go the traditional video game route when modeling out all of these environments, that would have been nigh impossible this decade to actually recreate everything for VR optimized the way it should have been. So we took all of the film assets and reprojected renders, 360 renders from the film environments and, and just basically splattered them back across the uh, geometry. But as you can see, if you go to a different perspective, things start to get a little messy. And so I'll talk about what we did to, to solve that issue. Uh, locomotion. So what the projection errors mean is that you have to restrict the locomotion of everything that you do. We want this world to feel real. We want it to feel like if I see a door over there, I can go to that door. We didn't want to make just a series of instances because we feel like that's robbing the user of the experience of feeling like this is a real place and I can actually walk to that location over there. So um, one thing that we had very early on was thumbstick walking, which everybody really enjoyed, but we knew we weren't going to be able to keep that in the final version because of this projection issue. So what we ended up with was a series of hierarchical teleportation tactics, which uh, I'll talk about later on but uh, hopefully it's something in the VR community that I, that I hope we can get past and we can just go straight to thumbstick walking from now on. Uh, take it from me. <laughs> okay, so ingesting the film assets. Uh, what you're looking at right here in this sort of accountant's office, if, you, if anybody has seen the movie, you might remember this scene where they had uh, this guy with like a little visor on and he was like a little tiny dude. This was his office. This was the first scene that we got and we were tasked with, Pixar was like, you guys think you're cool? Put this in VR. <laughs> and we did, it took us like three days. So we took this entire environment, we optimized it, we ran it through Houdini, we, we brought the poly count way down and then we asked Pixar for some render man renders from certain locations within that scene with all of the correct lighting, all of the correct shadows, all of, that, all of the texture information and then we reprojected it using spherical projection inside the environment, and we were there. It was actually pretty straightforward. These were all the first ideas that we had, and they worked. It was kind of freakish. Um, there, there were a couple of problems with the process. Like, for example, uh, Pixar spares no expense in modeling uh, books, for example. It's hard to tell, but literally every page of those books is in the book as geometry. I'm not even joking. <laughs> like you could go into that model and like get rid of the book cover and there will be 20 pieces of paper in there, all modeled. It's so the optimization process was absolutely critical. Um, uh, animation. Converting the animation from Presto, which is the proprietary software that Pixar uses, into something that we could use was a bit of a process. Um, since you can't take that animation data directly and export like an FBX, for example, we had to write our own pipeline to handle this. Um, a couple of ideas that we had right off the bat worked pretty well and our margin of error was actually really low, but um, it was really volatile. So what I would do is I would basically just track a geometry export 
a geometry cache rather, and I would look for specific vertices on the model that were moving, and then I would find their location, I would point to another vertex, I would find the up angle, and then I would track that over time, and then I would recreate a rig based off of that, and then we would convert that to an FBX, and we'd drop it into Unity, and everything was awesome, and it was super technical and very boring, but I thought it was exciting. I wrote like 200 lines of Python to do it, and then Pixar was like, we have something better. <laughs> I was like, cool. So they actually did something similar. They were able to rig Presto with the ability to extract all of that same information that I was doing, but higher up in the chain so it was more stable. Um, so we were able to get all of this body animation directly from what they were doing and put it straight into Unity. The facial animation was a bit different, however. For that, I wrote another script that would cut everyone's head off and put it at the center of the scene and then duplicate the mesh on every single frame, and then create a series of blend shapes so every single frame was a brand new model, essentially, that was replaying the animation. It is by far not the most efficient thing that you could ever do if you wanted to, like, the, if, you, if there's like a video game character animation artist in here, you're probably just going, what the, why? But I'm telling you, it looked great and maybe this is my problem. I shouldn't have been like, hey, Pixar, look, one-to-one -one animation. Because later on, you can't be like, hey, you know that animation that you guys like that was one-to-one? -one? We're going to make it worse. Um, but thankfully, they loved it, and it wasn't too much of a bottleneck, so we were able to keep that in there. And if you know anything about Pixar's animation, quality and style, the face, the head, the eyes, that's everything. So we were more than happy to leave that process in. Uh, textures. So as I've already mentioned before, textures were straight out of RenderMan, which is Pixar's renderer, and we were able to take spherical renders from that and put them into Unity and reproject from all of these different angles. This is actually a really um, major, major topic, and we had to write our own shaders to, to get this to come across. There's a huge paper, if you're interested, you can just Google Coco VR, uh, VRDC, spherical multi-projection. Um, as somebody who was able to sort of witness that from the outside, from like a safe distance, I'll try to explain what it is that we did. Um, and it's nice, I actually have a mic so I can move around. So basically what we did was, if I wanted to reproject this room, and I'm the VR user, we would tell Pixar, hey, render the scene from right here at about head height, and then if I'm able to move over here, render the scene again from here from about head height. So anywhere that I'm able to move around, just do all of these separate renders. And then when we projected the texture onto the walls, if I'm over here, I'm looking at everything projected from this location, so everything looks right from my point of view. But then if I start to walk over here, the shader is calculating which one is going to have the least amount of projection error if I'm in between this projection and this projection. So if I'm closer to this one, it's gonna start using this projection on this wall, but this projection on that wall. Does that make sense? Thought so. <laughs> All right, we prototyped everything. Um, so, the first three weeks of the process were all about benchmarking. So that accountant scene that we had, the uh, textures that we got, the animations that we got, all we did for the first three weeks was figure out what the quality level we could achieve was. So we took everything they gave us, we took that scene with all of the projections, we took an animated character, which uh, in our case was Hector, we took an animation file straight from the film, we dropped Hector into the scene with an audio file from the actor synced to uh, the facial animation, and so we were able to, within a, the first couple of weeks, take the director, drop him into this VR scene of this film that he's creating, and so he could look at his character and the character would be talking to him. That was very, very fast, and it was very narrow in scope, and meaning like if you moved around the scene too much, the projections would break and all of that kind of thing. But this was very, very important to establish very early on what our benchmark for quality was, and that informed the rest of the process. Uh, social interaction was also a major part of this. So not only did we need to make sure that we could port the Pixar quality, the visual fidelity, but we also needed to have this be 
a exciting thing that you could do with your friends in, in VR. So sideline to the art build that we were doing, we also had this social interaction build that we would do. And so we, we ripped the skeleton of the animated character that they gave us. We dropped that into a totally separate Unity project where we could just rig it up with IK systems and everything, get some voice over IP working, and drop other people, other Oculus users, into the same scene so we could talk to each other as skeletons. We had all of that stuff up and running first before we even talked about what the story would be, what the environments would be, what you could actually do in VR because we knew those were the most important things and that's what we wanted to get across at the end of the day. And it was really, really successful because throughout the rest of the project, anytime we were like, okay, this isn't really that valuable, I don't really like this that much, oh, it's because there's nothing really social about it. Or it's because we're not really showcasing that much visual quality. It's because, oh, this angle, this, this part of the environment is not particularly interesting. Or there's only room in this narrow alley for one person to stand, which is kind of boring. So it provided something that we could always just kind of go back to and refine. Okay, using that technology from the offset really, really helped us. If anybody comes from the film world, there's something called tech scouting that you do when you're about to shoot a movie. Okay, cool. Um, where you go out to the location with your DP, with your director, everything, and you take pictures of locations, you say, we're gonna put the camera here, we're gonna put the camera here, we're gonna shoot it like this, we're gonna do this kind of thing. We built that in VR so that we could actually take the director, we could take the producers, we could take any creative person from Pixar and drop them into the VR experience, hand, the, hand them a camera with the world coordinates readout on the screen and say, I want to put this thing here. I want to put that thing there. And they could draw a circle around it and send us notes in a really efficient way. They were the best teleconferences ever. Um, the only problem is you can't really like, you know if you're doing like a teleconference you could kind of stop paying attention for a little while. You can't do that in VR unfortunately. So I'm sorry I've introduced this technology to the world. But it is really rewarding. Uh, a shared experience. Uh, Coco VR is best experience with the group, um, but unfortunately most people don't do it that way. Most people do it solo. So we tried to incorporate a couple of things that would help the solo users, and I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna try to go over this quickly. Uh, we added a couple of things that you could do by yourself, like this, uh, when you put clothing on uh, in the very beginning of the experience, there's this little doll that actually will talk and react to everything that you're doing so that maybe you feel like you're not so alone <laughs> while the, while the uh, Oculus user base is starting to grow and grow and grow. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about here, the ensemble. The, uh, okay, the uh, photo booth. Um, it's really important to talk about uh, harassment in VR and the user space. I know you touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, especially for a Disney property, we wanna make sure that everybody is safe in this environment. So our camera that we used to run around the world with and take pictures a lot, we had to lock that off and make sure that nobody could take it and take incriminating photos with it. And if you can see right in the middle of that picture, that yellow hot piece right there, that's our no grope shader at work. So if you put your hands too close to somebody's private area, or if you put your hands too close to somebody's mouth, it will actually render your hand completely invisible. So this helps just as like a baseline to say, no funny business, let's just concentrate on cooperation and having fun. Okay, is that it? Okay, sorry. Uh, so it looks like I ran out of time, but if anybody's interested in um, any of the other great things that we did with Coco VR, I'm gonna be hanging out all day, so just stop and say, hey, hey. Cool. Thank you so much. All right, much. thanks. Yes. <laughs>